This program has been made possible in part by the following sponsors. David and Mark Goodman. Vancouver Courier Newspaper. Vancouver Lawyers, Dumoulin Boscovich. We have three departments attending to this issue, and yet we continue to have the highest child poverty rates in Canada. We have a Minister of Children and Family Development. These days, it's Mary McNeil. We have a Director of Child Welfare, a 25-year bureaucrat named Doug Hughes has been given this office. And that office was dormant for a while, but it's been reinvigorated and reestablished thanks to the third department, thanks to our guest today, who runs the third department, and that is Mary Ellen Terpella Fond, who is a representative for children and youth here in British Columbia. And folks, if you think that we uh, look a little different today, it's because we've come over uh, to Victoria. We're uh, on the road today, and we're in the Victoria Shaw studios uh, because Mary Ellen does not often uh, get to the city. But it's wonderful to see you, Mary Ellen. I'm a big fan of what you do, and I think it's kind of a daunting task. We should tell the folks at home uh, very quickly that Mary Ellen Terpel Fond does not come to this uh, occupation uh, unarmed. Uh, she was uh, the first Aboriginal person called to the bench in Saskatchewan. She has degrees from Carleton, Dalhousie, uh, Oxford, I think, and Harvard, mm -hmm. and not to mention a special a law degree from the University of Strasbourg in Alsace mm -hmm. <laughs> in France, and has held a number of wonderful positions, including teaching law uh, in Dalhousie and across the country. So let's jump quickly into one specific story, and then we'll get into some of the broader things. Tell us about this story about this 11-year-old kid being tasered in early April. Where has that gone? Just just tell everybody what happened, and then I know you jumped in on that, as, mm. as we knew you would. What's yeah. happened? Well, it's a really tough situation, and so, you know, I look at it from the child's perspective, what's happening right. to the child. And this is an 11-year-old boy in care, in care of the state. Um, and a situation where the police are called to a group home, uh -huh. uh, group home environment where he's living. And the uh, situation escalates to the point where a police officer uh, uses a taser uh, on the child. And um, obviously it's reported to me and I'm concerned about it. And every time a taser is used in British Columbia since the Braidwood inquiry, the use of the taser is required to be reported. Um, we still don't have you know, police oversight quite in place, uh, but what happened with respect to the RCMP officer's use of that taser is that it's under review by another police force at the moment. And so there's the policing issues of, yes. you know, should police be out using tasers on children? There's right. that issue. And then there's My, the child issue. And there's the issue of what about this child? Yes. Like what is going on in the life of this child that, um, you know, staff or others who are there to support him uh, feel that the police have to be called in. And so I looked at the situation. My first priority is to make sure that child's safe and look at the plan for the child, talk to the director of child welfare, make sure we can, you know, is the child safe? Is he healthy? Is he all right? And is he recovering from the trauma of this experience? Uh, and are the behavior issues he may be having, you know, what, what's causing them? So, so we worked on that. You know, that's an ongoing thing we're working on together very collaboratively. But it drove me to a deeper issue, which is group homes, operating where kids have pretty significant needs. You know, we don't have a regional, you know, psychiatric youth facility for kids with complex needs. They may be in group home settings. And are those group home settings really qualified and trained? Um, in this case, it was a private operator of a for-profit group home, if you like, as opposed to kind of a government-operated home. You know, what are the, what standards are there? What Are the employees trained? And 
Moreover, how are the kids doing that are there, and why are they so young? How, how is this specific kid doing as we speak? Is he is sort of okay? Uh, you know, we, we keep a very watch. I keep a very watchful eye on his situation. Was, was he lumpy Rutherford? I mean, was he one of these six um, foot four, uh, well, three hundred pound, yeah. eleven year olds? Was uh, well, he out of control? Uh, I don't want to uh, okay. share too much private okay. information about him because okay. I really want to protect his privacy. Um, I think what's really important to know is it's a child who has needs for sure, right. um, who has some real challenging behaviors without a doubt, um, but also has experienced a lot of trauma, a lot of um, issues in his life where you would expect he could become quite upset over things. And um, his environment, I think, is something that we've had to look at really carefully, meaning you know, I, w kids can get really worked up. Like when you live in a group home, for instance, your use of the phone is regulated. Yes. You know, your use of the fridge. I mean, it's not like you're a child living in your home who comes in, flops on the couch and does whatever. I mean, there's all these rules and there can be a lot of power struggles. I mean, every parent who has a, a child will know there's power struggles. Did you see the story in today's paper about the girl who shot her father? Yeah, that was pretty with grave it, in the States. With an arrow and yeah. then she wouldn't let him dial 911? Yeah, that was quite severe. Because yeah. he took away her cell phone. And, well, yeah. you know, there are children, you know, children. some children have pretty big issues. That yes. was an extreme case. Yeah. Lucky that wasn't in British Columbia, so right. I don't have to worry about Good. that one. But with this young boy, um, you know, I am looking at the group homes and I think that they, they're using the police. The police are being called out frequently to group homes in that region of the province to do what I would consider things that parents would do like put the children to bed, make sure they come in the house. Uh, so that tells me that something's not working. And so I'm now investigating and looking into that issue um, and really exploring that because, you know, is it the best environment for kids? You know, I told you before we went on air, Mary Ellen, that many years ago I, I ran a treatment center which is still running. We had men, women and children. We never called the police, not once in the 10 years that I ran it. And as far as I know, in the 40 years it's been running, uh, we, 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 we never had to use violence to subdue a kid and we, believe me, we had the most difficult kids. It just doesn't come to that. If you're mm -hmm. running a program that is thorough and you know what you're doing, uh, you know, you, you shouldn't have to resort to the police. But let me ask you this, what, what tools do you have when you step into a situation like that? This is, this, your office is an office of the government of British Columbia. Yes. Yeah, well, my office yes. is an office of the Legislative Assembly, so it's yes. independent in the sense that I'm a nonpartisan independent officer. So uh -huh. when I was appointed, I was appointed with the agreement of all the members of the Legislative Assembly from both of the parties. Now yes. we have independence, we didn't yes. then, but in any event. Um, and so my role is really to be that independent, neutral person who looks at it and then reports out to British Columbians. So I don't have a partisan lens. Yes. Um, but also, you know, being factually accurate, being neutral is important. But I'm not neutral in the sense that I have a very strong position to be an advocate for children. To make and you sure. do more than report? Oh, yeah. I think that um, a role like the one I'm playing, there's a, there's a lot of things in your toolbox. Yes. The first thing is to develop the best relationships you can with officials and others in the system so that they'll want to pay attention to things, you know, before they become big issues. That can be a challenging process, you know, um, and it certainly has, was challenging for me for a bit. Um, the other thing is the ability to report to the public is a powerful thing and to tell the public the stories of children um, and particularly vulnerable children in British Columbia, children in care, children who may be injured, children who may be completely at the mercy of their caregivers. Um, tell British Columbians the stories of their circumstances so we can build better supports for them. And, and you're doing that fairly consistently. We all follow uh, what you mm -hmm. do as much as we can mm -hmm. in the press and so on. I think that's why so many people are pleased about what mm -hmm. you're doing. But you know, what you, you said something very subtle mm -hmm. and I want to explore that a bit. You said, you know, you, you have to, you know, get government people on side. You don't want to alienate them. Mm -hmm. you, uh, people who run departments and, and so on. Uh, and of course, you're, you're not in the business of burning bridges, you're in the business of working with people, mm -hmm. but it can't be too long after you begin investigating things, you discover that the very people who are responsible for certain things, to be honest, have dropped the ball mm -hmm. they, well, for one reason or another, whether they are entirely culpable or solely culpable, mm -hmm. but they've been dropping the ball. Mm -hmm. You know, now what do you do? 
Well, one thing that I found um, in my last sort of four years working in this area in British Columbia is remarkable, remarkable commitment by the frontline staff in the Ministry for Children and Family Development, in income assistance and others who are in the community serving sector. A lot of, you know, amazing work that's done and real frustration at the front line that yes. they often get chopped up, like their services are cut, their titles are changed, they're given these big shifts in what they can do, what they can't do, um, that the Ministry for Children and Families in particular is in this perpetual you know, transformation, change, exercise, they don't know what it means. All they know is they're going to knock on someone's door and do something and they can't seem to help them with the presenting problems when those families are falling apart. And so I found a real, you know, sincere, sincere, like uh, just astonishingly, astonishingly competent and caring yes. staff in the front lines. I found a real disconnect sometimes between those folks and the folks thinking about how the system works. And so a lot of the work has been me going to the senior staff saying, did you know that, that. your system works like this? Yes. You know, and, and I think you, d you need to work on it. Uh, let's talk about the word oversight. I mean, in a sense, your whole job is one of oversight. But we've seen it in labor, we've seen it in construction, in farm mm -hmm. workers, and so on, that BC governments over the years, I don't point my finger at any one mm -hmm. in particular, we've we've cut off the number of people who are checking on things, you know, making sure that there are seat belts in vans that transport farm workers, and making sure that those group homes are are doing at, at least the bare minimum of what they claim to be get, get paid to do. So what are you able to do about that? Well, you can do a lot, but I think you, you hit a really key point about what is oversight. I mean, oversight I involves, yes, you know, 90% of what I do is behind the scenes talking, cajoling, encouraging, you know, make sure there's money for this program, make sure it keeps running. And I've had more than 6,000 advocacy cases in four years. So a lot of those cases wow. are someone needs a ramp, they're in a wheelchair, someone needs braces, they're in care. Like a lot of those things we resolve. And you can resolve those specifics. Yes, we, we do. We, we work really hard to do that. But the big systemic issues yes. on like, are we really, you know, are we speaking with confidence about what we're achieving for children in British Columbia? Are we really creating an environment of equal opportunity for all children? And what about vulnerable children? What about Aboriginal children? What about children with special needs, children living out of the home? Are we really doing everything we can? This is where I think we get into the, 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 the difference. At one hand, there's the political issues. Yes. And my side is, well, if you're doing it, tell me how. Show us how, a high level of accountability. So oversight requires someone's keeping an eye on what you're doing, which in and of itself for government is uncomfortable. Yes. But it's something that everyone has had to get comfortable with because it's here to stay and it's necessary. And it's not just money. It's not no. just throwing green at the problem. No. It, it's, it's value it, for your money. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. Okay, lovely. We're going to take a little uh, breather, folks. I remind you that uh, you can uh, check out our social media or send us emails at davidburner.com. Um, and uh, we'll just take a little breath and come back with our guest, Mary Ellen Turpel, the founder representative for children and youth in British Columbia, uh, and take a moment to thank these lovely uh, people who make it possible for us to bring you this program here on Shaw Community Television Cable 4. KCM Wealth Management. Vancouver Lawyers, Dumoulin Boscovich. The Vancouver Courier Newspaper. David and Mark Goodman. Here are some of the basics from the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, and if you think these don't play out as far away as places like Vancouver, you're wrong, they do. Uh, children have a right to be protected and kept safe. Families are the best environment for raising a child. Parents and extended family have the primary responsibility for a child, and decisions made about a child 
should include their own views and input, although not necessarily choosing their own gender as the couple in Toronto are trying to do mm -hmm. with the child or they will only know him, name mm -hmm. Storm. Our mm -hmm. guest is mm -hmm. Mary Ellen Turbell Lafon, who is the representative for uh, children and families. Those are some of the ideals of the United Nations Conference on the Rights of Children, yet here's a, a almost typical sort of press report, staffing shortages, inexperienced social workers, inadequate supervision continue to undermine the government's efforts to protect our most vulnerable kids. And you're nodding. Yeah, well, I think the challenge in British Columbia for the, over the years that I've been here is to see that we actually have a consistent, effective child welfare system in all places at all times. Um, I think one of the issues is really sometimes if it's even a system meaning adequately staffed, supported, clear standards that are being applied and clear accountability. I mean, we have broad legislation, but how are we implementing it? And so some of the investigations I've done look at things like, you know, our standards to respond to a child protection report. Are we out there responding promptly? Are we responding by, you know, deciding to launch an investigation? Or are we just saying, no, we don't need to investigate? And what informs that? And of course, I look at the deaths and injuries of children, and I actually go and interview people and investigate, like an inquiry almost. Yes. And then report and say, could you know, were, were there issues, generally systemic issues here? And uh, in some places, I find, yeah, well, there's very high caseloads, or there isn't experienced staff, or they're not sure what to do. So some of those things are always have to be kept in mind, and where you need to improve systems you need to be really committed to constant improvement, which means getting some feedback, including from outside government, in order or, to change that. Or, or, or frontline people are sometimes simply form fillers or order takers rather than really listening, rather than hearing, rather mm -hmm. than, as my mother used to teach me, listen for what isn't said, listen for right. the opposite, and so on. Or a poker player would say, look for the tells, mm -hmm. <laughs> look, for, look for the winks and nods that, mm -hmm. that tell where, where someone is coming from. If someone begins by saying, well, you know, my husband's a bit of a gambler, mm -hmm. it turns mm -hmm. out with the smallest of bit of prompting that he's in fact an abusive SOB. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and that was just the tip of the iceberg. Right. I think uh, what I learned pretty quickly in British Columbia was uh, there's these problems within the system. Yes. The system has been chopped up and changed and you know so on. There's a lot of change. But also the presenting problems that families have who come into the child welfare system, many Aboriginal families and others, Really, I see the issues around poverty, how exactly. families are struggling with poverty. And I know poverty can be seen as being a real, oh, whatever, what does that mean? Which is a rich province. By poverty, I mean real deep financial insecurity, sometimes intergenerationally for the Aboriginal families. Real insecurity around their housing. Sometimes the child is removed because there is no way the young parent can secure adequate housing. They're living with a relative who's a person of concern. They can't go out and get new housing. Uh, there's no short-term emergency assistance. These systems are really hard to navigate, especially for Aboriginal uh, families. Uh, and the child's removed. And so a, a family is broken. Yes. You know, why? Because we couldn't deal with the presenting issue. So the actual safety, the abuse and neglect of a child was not at issue. What it was at issue was a set of life circumstances where you have to really think, you know, have we made sufficient supports to get the real return we want to get, which is good development for the child, good support for the parents. Have you been following uh, one of our great guests who has had so many hits on our YouTube version of this show, uh, Calvin Heelan, yeah. you know, talking about get off the couch, stop eating potato chips, get mm -hmm. a job, build a business, push your children into university, you know, do something and stop accepting uh, uh, monies from governments because mm -hmm. it's killing you. Yeah, well, I'm, I, I understand where he's coming yeah. from with that, and yeah. I think it's it's got an appeal. Yeah, I think it can be very punishing that attitude as well, though, uh, because okay. you know when your grandfather went to residential school and was sexually abused, and became an alcoholic, and, and was maybe, told never to speak your language. Well, and maybe became yeah, very yeah. full of hate, and yes, then maybe yeah. sexually abused yeah. your mother, yeah. who in turn is struggling with alcoholism and so on. So, you know. Uh, the magic bullet theory, which is just get up and get out there and do it. I I'm come from a slightly different view of that. My yeah, view yeah, is, yeah. you know, we're really resilient. Children are resilient. Yes. But in order to be successful, there needs to be really dependable, positive adults in their life that really connect with them. 
and they need to see that path that they can see that they're going to have people standing with them to say yeah get a good education yes I'm here with you you know we are going to be supported and they need that in different areas so the idea of someone just saying you know pull yourself up by your bootstraps that's it's a bit of, it. of a myth yeah, but, it, but, but the mentality it. is good like you are a survivor get up and do it and also you know your opportunities are limitless but it's really hard when you're living in a moldy house yes. uh, there's no running water there's 18 people sleeping in that house and your baby brother just died it's pretty hard to get pull yourself up by your bootstraps we need more supportive systems and, around and, people. and, and uh, people you know well Seth Klein from the Canadian alternatives uh, policy alternatives and Adrienne Montani uh, uh, first call BC children youth advocacy wrote a marvelous piece in the paper mm -hmm. the other day that you and I were looking at during during mm -hmm. the break and they talk about bringing back the practice of bringing on stream 2,000 new units of social housing every year, uh, a non-profit child care system, mm -hmm. uh, raising minimum wages, which the Premier has, has finally done, yeah. and, and, and so on. Uh, so we ha this whole issue uh, of uh, children at risk is intimately tied to poverty. Is Absolutely. It, it's, yeah. it's all about that. And I think the challenge is we have a, you know, it's where social policy and economic policy come together. I see the front lines of it, and that is, you know, an economic policy of an expansion, expanding economy, the sort of rising tide floats all boats, we have to create yeah. jobs. But actually, we've had the expanding economy, and we have produced some greater social inequality. And in particular, the really, really deep intergenerational poverty like the Aboriginal poverty both urban and on reserve yes. Aboriginal poverty yep. I don't think we've made enough of a dent and so this Barely. the economic and social policies we have haven't worked for that cohort of children and I think we need to come together and plan better for that I mean I'm, I'm glad to see you know some more investments in things like shelter allowances and yes. minimum wage and so on but um, there's different sort of gradations of people in poverty uh, and I really want us to have a plan in British Columbia to show that we can, you know, lift those children out of poverty. Well, you've led us right to the to the obvious sort of mm -hmm. conclusion of this conversation. We've still got lots of time, mm -hmm. but if you had a magic wand, if you woke up Monday morning, and someone said, mm -hmm. "All right, stop the presses. It's all yours, Mary Ellen. Yeah. You can do whatever you want mm -hmm. to right this ship." Mm -hmm. Tell us the kinds of things you would do. Well, I think, it, I think it would be that broad-based, nonpartisan, meaning not just one party, both sides of the B.C. Legislative Assembly really having hearings. We got the Select Standing Committee on Children and Youth to all sit down and do this a bit, and it turned yes. out to be really successful. Okay. Everybody kind of got on the same page. Um, I would like to see us have a real poverty reduction plan that isn't just about raising one rate. It's about making sure vulnerable kids, kids in poverty, Aboriginal kids do well in school. Set goals. Yeah, set goals, set Meet targets. Them. Target Meet them. Meet them, target, and make it, make it meaningful. And um, make sure that the significant investments that we do make are good value for money. So if we are subsidizing give housing. Me, give, give me an example. Subsidizing housing. Well, okay. you know, we, yep. do, we, okay. do, we provide rental allowances, yes. for instance, but you have to be working at a certain threshold to qualify from them. There's subsidies. Yes. Um, you know, how, how often are those going to say Aboriginal families? So the targeting of our investment is, is a question mark, but also, you know, the federal provincial, we, we need to have a federal provincial agreement, particularly around Aboriginal children's poverty, because the paved road ends often and there's no services and no supports and although 80 percent of Aboriginal you know children in BC live in urban centers um, there's a lot of migration back and forth yes and so I think it, uh, you know first of all I'm very cautious about having a magic bullet you know is there a absolutely. magic wand no, no. and a magic first thing these are complex issues absolutely but e producing out an outcome and creating a more equal society is really significant because social cohesion how we understand and get along together in a society really depends on these issues of equality the, the, the solutions are going to be a hundred little steps aren't absolutely they? and across multiple yeah. like social serving systems education child welfare health Justice. Right. I mean, there is no silver. In no. addictions work, I always talk yeah. about the governments and, and, and people wanting silver mm -hmm. bullets. You know, like safe injection sites. Good luck. Yeah. You know that that's one little idea. Well, politicians, yeah. you know, they're very tempted, and I can understand yes. it because they get pressured. You know, yeah. they want to come out and say everyone is going to read in five years, <laughs> yeah. and I'm going to do it. And then yeah. guess what? It's a total failure. Yeah. Um, you know. Well, the question is the how. It's not the what we want to accomplish. We want to promote, to, so you know, not by accident of birth, one child is going to have a great upbringing, another child won't. 
Yes. We want to level that playing field as much as we can. So we want to make these early investments in early in children's early years to make sure that they're safe, that they're supported, that they're healthy, that they're doing well in school, uh, so that uh, when they come into adulthood, you know, they can realize their full potential. But we have to really work to coordinate our system. So in BC, there's been a lot of challenges to say we're, you know, we're going to shrink this part of government, we're going to expand that part, we're going to do, and, and there's been a lot of choppiness. So to me, like some stability, some agreement across parties, I know that's very idealistic as well, but I think we need to depoliticize children. I mean, we need to all agree ch child poverty is something we have to all work on with equal measure. Absolutely. It has and nothing to do with political no. beliefs. No. Yeah. And so we can yeah. all, we, and it's also fair to have a discussion. You know, I would like the leader of the opposition and the premier to sit down and talk about it. Well, what would you do in a, we got about two minutes, what would you do in a nutshell about education? I think very quickly about uh, my old friend Gloria Webster, mm -hmm. who I think mm -hmm. was the first Aboriginal person to graduate mm -hmm. from university. Mm -hmm. And I remember being astonished being in the Canadian Embassy in Washington and mm -hmm. hearing her voice and mm -hmm. turning around and she was on a video that was playing. Mm -hmm. But how many people knew about Gloria's accomplishment? Yeah. A handful. Yeah. You know? Well, education is a great place to start. Kids come into kindergarten, we know they're behind when they come into kindergarten. Yes. We do not do enough. By the time they're in grade four and we assess them, we find out they're still behind. They're in grade seven, they're still behind, then they don't graduate. But guess what? We knew from kindergarten. We had them captive for 12 years. You know what we need to do? We need to do much better and we can. There's a few school districts that have just totally turned the results around by doing things differently, yes. more intensive, yes. different techniques. And I know it can work, but it requires money, focus. Effort, and it training. And it requires everyone to stay focused on what is the most important thing is what about the kids? The education system <laughs> is there for the kids. <laughs> what about mm -hmm. the kids? Yeah. Mary Ellen, thanks so much. Thank you, David. I really love the work you're doing. Thank I you. just think it's so terrific. It's just so Thank important. You. Thanks. Uh, that's it, folks. Uh, next week, uh, a little change of tune. Uh, showbiz, the times they are a change. And the Hollywood Theater is closing after 35 years. And Graham Pete, who will be our guest, is closing down Videomatica, that specialty video store. And it's just an example of how the many platforms of uh, entertainment, which is a huge part of our lives, is uh, changing. So, uh, DavidBurner.com, the place to go for emails and such. Thanks for being with us again here on Shaw Community Television, Cable 4. Thank you.